Hello everyone, thanks for coming. What a great few days so far. I want to start with you by sharing the Nota Dog Meat story and the work of our amazing grassroots partners. We are working together to help end the cruel dog and cat meat trade. We then have a short video and after that, I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. My name is Julia de Cadenet, and I'm the founder of World Protection for Dogs and Cats in the Meat Trade, or as everyone knows us, No to Dog Meat. I've been traveling to China since 1999, but it took me until 2009 when I was in Guangzhou in southern China that I first came across the horrific dog meat market. My experience made me realize that it took more than just donating to animal charities. I needed to do something more. What shocked me the most was seeing a torture market right next door to a market selling pet dogs. And what saddened me the most was when I turned round, I saw a boy who could have been no more than seven or eight years old, clutching a puppy his dad had just bought him. The two of them watched silently with me as almost identical dogs were being dragged out of their cages and killed right in front of us. This was wrong on so many levels, for the poor animals, of course, but also for the child's moral development. I spent the next few years on the ground learning all I could about the horrible trade. And then in 2012, I started a social media campaign using our distinctive No to Dog Meat logo. And I invited everyone from around the globe to join our movement. By 2013, our World Protection Charity was established. And then a few years later, we were granted consultative status at the UN. And so from humble grassroots beginnings, our journey began. The more I researched the taboo subject of using dogs and cats for food and fur, the more I saw how widespread the problem was. It's hard to believe that over 30 million dogs and cats will have been tortured and killed this year in Central and Southeast Asia. I've now witnessed a decade of terrible suffering, and despite the risk to public health and even the pandemic, this black market trade, especially in China, has not slowed down. The dogs and cats used for food and fur are often strays or stolen pets, but they can also come from dog farms. They can come from pet breeding farms, and we've even found this year they come from grooming parlors. They are all killed in a really cruel way. In some regions, people believe that if the animal suffers, the stress of the torture makes cortisol rush through the body, and which will then tenderize the meat. But in my experience, it is a complete disregard for sentience. There is no connection between a dog and cat's life and pain. I don't eat meat, so I don't think any animal should suffer. However, seeing someone's pet dismembered, plunged into boiling water, or barbecued after being skinned alive is a living nightmare. I'm a lawyer, so I knew I could help in pushing for animal welfare laws to be created or amended, but then I soon realized it was human attitudes that needed to change. So for this reason, in addition to our policy, which allows from individuals from all walks of life to join our campaign, we set up partnerships with grassroots advocates who share our vision of kindness. And this is how our collaborations began. We have created a unique series of education and outreach programs that our partners can adapt to suit their own circumstances. It has taken time because we spent years on the ground trying to ourselves trying to understand why, for example, someone would sell their pet for food, learning how people really felt about the trade. And we've also communicated with butchers to get their perspective. I know it's hard to solve a complex issue such as the dog and cat meat trade from a remote air conditioned office. However, I truly believe if we work together locally to nurture empathy and compassion towards our companion dogs and cats, if we can help everyone understand the meaning of animal sentience, this in turn can bring change. I would like to share some examples of our work in China, Cambodia and the Philippines. In 2015, we set up a partnership shelter with a courageous animal lover called Mr. Zhao in Hebei, China. We had previously worked together on some of the daring truck rescues, the kind of videos you may have seen on the internet. We share a vision of compassion and change. At our shelter, we invite volunteers to come and they are all ages and genders, even retired students and even retired ladies who come to help prepare the dog's food. We find that engaging with animal lovers across generations helps us to spread the message to communities who hold false beliefs about the benefits of eating dogs or drinking cat tonics. 
We have real friendships with our partners and they bravely come with us to notorious meat festivals such as Yulin. They also help us raid slaughterhouses and stop the big trucks on the highway. Their hard work is humbling and facing such suffering is difficult. What motivates them is to see how our rescues recover when they reach our sanctuary and how they still trust humans after everything they've been through. Many of our rescues are rehomed overseas. However, when we can, we try to place them within families in China. Our work with grassroots volunteers has helped them to understand the dog and cat meat trade and join us to make a difference. The pandemic presented a challenge for us, but also an opportunity for one of our former volunteers from Hebei to set up a base closer to Beijing. Initially, this place was supposed to house a handful of rescues waiting to fly to new homes overseas. But with the continuing sale of dogs for meat, we now have over 267 dogs and cats there. And in Hebei, we have over 500. Anna is a university graduate. She has taken our education program to companies in Beijing. She gives lunchtime awareness talks about the trade and lets people know about our adoption programs. This initiative has been very successful. Recently, she was invited to bring some of our rescued dogs to a film premiere in Beijing. We saw this as another innovative approach to engagement and change. Like Mr. Zhao, Anna invites students to visit the dogs and cats at the shelter. She also hosts meet and greet adoption events in shopping malls. Previously, it was frowned upon to bring dogs, especially dog meat trade survivors, to such public venues, but slowly they're being more and more well received. It's heartening to see parents learning about where the animals have come from, and it also teaches them that our survivors are just the same as any shop-bought pets. At the beginning of the presentation, you may recall, I shared with you seeing children witness animal torture and how this really affected me. We've continued to raise this issue with the UN and how it relates to their own sustainability and development goals. And I'm pleased to announce that just last month, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child included a note in their General Assembly on the harmful effects to children participating in and witnessing violent animal abuse. For us, this showed a significant step forward to lasting change. In Cambodia, we've made educating young children a big part of our local collaboration. Although eating dogs is still endorsed by those in power at festivals involving alcohol, the main reasons people sell strays or their dogs to dealers is economically driven. When we set up a partner program close to the Thai border, we at once saw how the so-called pot and pan men would tour villages exchanging plastic buckets for hapless dogs. So this gave us the idea to work with village officials to do things like building a small well so everyone could have clean water. And we found working with the local community helped us build trust and gain support. We have also worked closely with school teachers and encouraged them to introduce animal welfare as part of the curriculum. This year, our activities are centered more closely on the capital, Phnom Penh, where dog meat is frequently sold in roadside kiosks. Our partner there, Tet Lin, also went out to the Kandal province to try some experimental learning techniques. The children walked alongside some of Tet's rescues and then ceremoniously buried a slaughtered dog's head. They were taught about how animals have feelings and how kindness matters. Of course, we know learning should be fun and how important sport is to youngsters. So during the pandemic, the famous London Marathon was held virtually, meaning it could, anyone could run it anywhere in the world. So it was wonderful to see teams of school children rise to the challenge of run for the dogs. They all received a medal and were joined by our supporters worldwide who also ran. This created a feeling of solidarity and being a part of our family for change and helped us to strengthen our voice that cruelty is not cool. In the last 10 years, we have protested and lobbied Western and Asian governments to create and implement animal protection laws. We know in 2020, China declared dogs and cats on the agricultural safe list and therefore in theory, at least not food. And in Korea, ministers have recently called to end the trade. We know also, however, that if law is created but not enforced, dogs and cats will continue to suffer. This brings me to our final example of grassroots collaboration and the bold work of our friend Greg Campo in the Philippines. He has been working with us on a brave new approach to bring change to the Visayas Islands close to his hometown. And this is something we plan to expand to other regions. 
Unlike many parts of Asia, the, Filipina, the Philippines has had an Animal Welfare Act since 1988. There is also a special provision to exclude the use of dogs for food, the only exception being ritual slaughter of animals. Change, however, takes patience and is a process. And our project, which is endorsed by local authorities, we go with the police to enforce legislation. To do this, however, they need to be well versed in the law and share our concerns. And this is something our local partner, Greg, can effectively communicate. Working with authorities, we have been giving official lectures on animal welfare at police stations. And going with the police into the community, we have been able to engage with villagers. It has actually been amazing to see the caring side of the police. And through the medium of animal welfare, they too have improved their own community engagement. Our activities have included donating food and veterinary supplies and guiding villagers on how to care for their companion animals, and all the while reinforcing our message that dogs are not food. Our work in Asia is ongoing and requires dedication, a flexible approach, and needs to be tailored to the unique circumstances of each country. We believe, however, as moral beings, we must promote an ethical framework that includes animals. For our own human story and progress, taking dogs and cats off the menu is for the benefit of all. Here is a small roundup video of our grassroots projects, which we hope you will find inspiring. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Any question? Anything? <laughs> yes, hi, hi, thank you. <laughs> does, um, does No to Dog Meat work alongside other international organizations on this topic? Well, we are an international organization yeah, ourselves, yeah. albeit a small one. Uh, no, other ones, I mean. And um, we mostly work alongside Asian organizations. Uh, but one of our, we love to work alongside bigger organizations. We love to work alongside anyone. Um, but because we started from grassroots, or the, albeit that we lobby from the top down, um, most of our work to date has been forging friendships and collaborations within the country but certainly to grow, we would love more collaboration with other organizations. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think just to conclude, because obviously I went through everything quite quickly, just to really give you a snapshot of who we are and what we do. I just really believe that we can all work together to make a difference. And everyone, when we say no action too small, we believe in that because everyone actually has a skill that they can bring when it comes to change. They could be great at social media, they could be a rescuer on the ground, they could be a veterinary professional, but understanding each other, why problems are there and how we can move forward is how we will evolve as a society and how change will come. And whilst I'm mostly in my comfort zone when it comes to lobbying the governments and presenting proposals to the UN, it's been very humbling for me to actually work to start the shelters, to be on the face of things, because it's then I've actually seen the dedication of other activists around me. And when I spoke of their motivation to continue, when I see their bravery, that's my motivation to continue. And I think that's something that we all share. Thank you.